No, that doesn't work. Okay, so I need it uh, right in front of it. Um, no, not George. How's it going? Let's have a close up of the end, right? So if you just go like this, and do like. No, no, let the. Oh, you're not. Okay. Um, what does that do? It's just for us to sync up. Do you mind doing it once? Just like. Just me? In yeah. front of your face. Oh, goody, I'd love to. Perfect. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, so I, I want to start with that song. Can you sing it? <laughs> Two of you together. Me, me, me. She. That's too high. <laughs> Can't get too high. She. Na no yo. To admit that was beautiful. We're going to use it for the credits. That was <laughs> it's probably it's probably going to be excised from the uh, well, from know, the that footage. Was, that was a really good rehearsal, but now that you, now that you both are in tune, but it's it too high. You want to do it again? Let's do it again, and then okay. tell me. And then after you finish doing it, tell me what it is, and tell me what it meant to Jim. China night. Okay, but let's do it a little bit lower. She,しのよう。しのよう。みなとのあかりむらさきのように。のぼるじゃんくの。China night, the uh, the bright lights of the Minato. What Minato? Minato is uh, of the uh, what do you call a place where ships come in? Harbor. Harbor. Uh, <laughs> the bright lights of the harbor uh, are like purple. Murasaki no yoni. The jumps come, junks coming upstream, are like uh, dream boats. Uh, it's 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 like uh, let's see, it's like a dream you can't forget. China night, China night. That's a very rough translation. I think Dr. Budberg would not be happy with it. He's not <laughs> Dr. Though. Mr. Budberg That's right. would not be happy with it. But it, he it's, close en it's close PhD. enough for government work, as we used to say in the Army. Oh, oh you promised me you'd never say that again. I did, didn't I? Oh, well. What, what, where did the song come from? Where did you first hear it? And why, and why was it? And this, this song was the theme song of a movie, which you will not believe this, is called China Night, <laughs> and it is a movie. I don't know 
how the language school got hold of a copy of it, but they did because by this time there was no uh, car, no, no anything between the Japanese and, the Amer and America. Uh, but they did have it, and the idea was that we would hear spoken Japanese because the movie was a propaganda film to show that the Chinese and Japanese could get along. And the main characters are a Japanese ship captain who is whose ship is in this harbor, harbor. and uh, a beautiful <laughs> Chinese woman of naturally high-ranking social position. And she was a beauty. Oh, she was gorgeous. And we saw this had to be at least one time a week in the, uh, the law school auditorium. I should remember the name of that. I was in there often enough. This but anyway, we Arbor? heard it over and over and over and over until almost all of us could sing it by heart. It's, uh, you all knew the dialogue of the whole movie by heart. Probably is one scene where the captain is captured by ch bad Chinese bandits and uh, he's given X number of minutes to reveal some secret. I can't remember what it is. And the, the, the guy on the clock would say, Ato gofun. You have five minutes left. And then Ato yongfun. You have four minutes left. Ato sampun. And they got to Ato ipun. And the Japanese military come in and rescue him and <laughs> capture the bad Chinese bandits and throw them. You know, I mean, it's so hokey. <laughs> it's so obviously propaganda that we just ate it up. It was like a, it was a cult classic for us. That's the only thing I can think of. And uh, uh, Jim, Jim, wait, Jim wait, let me just ask. You're crossing your feet and we're getting a leather squeal between the You are pieces. indeed. I'm sorry Maybe about that. I will that. separate my feet so they will not squeal. Thank you. And just talk to George. We're not here. Don't don't look at us. Oh, that's right. Uh, you told me that already. Yeah. Well, now, Jim Cahill had a, a special relationship with this film. Can you talk about that? I don't know that there's a special relationship. Well, it's the same as all of you. What? Same as all of you, that you, you loved that film. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding you. The same relationship that all that everybody had with it. They loved, oh. and they loved uh, you, Yamaguchi Toshiko. Yes, yes. <coughs> I'm not sure what the question was. Well, talk about, talk about Yamaguchi Toshiko. Uh, well, this was a... Uh, a well-known uh, Chinese actress whose father was a, a uh, an official in Manchuria, Japanese official in Manchuria, and uh, her mother was a well well-to-do Chinese lady, and they fell in love and married and had this girl. The girl was a, a beauty, a real beauty, and she spoke both Japanese and. Mandarin Chinese fluently. So <clears throat> when the, her father was reassigned back to Japan, uh, he did not bring his wife, but he did bring his daughter. And the daughter was discovered by the producer of this movie, and I'm not sure who that was. And she became a movie star uh, almost overnight. It's a big movie star. And her Chinese name was Ri Koran or Li Koran, depending on which part of China you're pronouncing your words from. But she was a, a, a real beauty. And uh, I remember one night in the officers' club in the Allied translator and interpreter section, which owned all of the uh, NYK building. <coughs> We were all sitting up there drinking our drinks and talking to the uh, ladies uh, who were allowed to come to this club because we were to practice our Japanese with them. <laughs> uh, and we were, you know, just generally talking and 
All of a sudden, the door opened, and our friend Ulrich Strauss, also a graduate of the language school, also somebody who'd been subjected to the movie for innumerable number of times, comes walking in with Gricord on, on his arm. And the place was dead silence for about three seconds. We just could not believe that any of us could have discovered Ricordon and let alone her willingness to come. Well, it turned out that they both had houses in Kamakura next to each other. So when Uli went back, there was Ricordon living next to him and they became quite friendly. Ricordon ultimately came to the States and took her Japanese name. Her father's name was Yamaguchi, Yamaguchi Toshiko. She made a couple of B-grade movies that were not too good, and nothing happened. And then I lost track of her altogether. I just never heard of her again. But that movie is so powerfully imprinted on my <laughs> mind <laughs> that uh, I, I just I, I probably will never forget it. And when a bunch of us, well, not too many of us left anymore, but when a bunch of us used to get together, we would invariably mm. sing Shina no Yoru together. It would just... I learned it from somebody else, not from George. But one of our colleagues. Yes, uh, One from of Hans. my colleagues, yeah. Hans Beerwald. Yeah, we all, we, we just all, you know, if you watch something, there's something to the pedagogical rule that repetition is the soul of education. Because with that... <laughs> <laughs> that movie was repeated so often. Sure learned the song. Everybody <laughs> could sing it correctly. I mean, it was just amazing. But that I, I would like to see. I wonder if the the Defense Language Institute might have a copy of that, you know, left over from the old days in Michigan. Wouldn't that be something? I wonder if they, when we go to the Bach Festival, let's go over to the to DLI oh, yeah. in Monterey and, to and anyway. go to the Japanese section and see if they still have a copy yeah, of that. If you find it, let me know. I'll okay. sure, certainly do that. Give us your card. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. If, if, um, I want to go back to how you got to the language school um, and, and your, your story about the language itself and... and uh, uh, knowing it and forgetting Japanese and then relearning it. And then uh, if you could weave in your first meetings with Jim Cahill there, they were at the school, I think. Well, uh, see, Jimmy uh, when uh, got into the January class. He was older and he was drafted before I was. He was in the January class. So the January class had a section of the uh, University of Michigan dormitories. They had one quadrant, one quarter, one corner. And we were in the May class and we had a different corner. It was adjacent. But there wasn't that much intercommunication. They had their classes. We had our classes. Uh, we, could, we would cross each other at uh, mess time. Wouldn't we? And we had a wonderful mess crew of Nisei, Japanese Americans, who got into the army to get out of the, the camps, the relocation centers, and they traded potatoes for rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had rice with every meal. Right? And but everybody would be standing line in line using their kanji cards, the character cards, trying to memorize them, getting ready for the Saturday morning exam, which was every Saturday, and which determined your placement. In the, excuse me. in the exams were uh, basically oral, that is speech, uh, I would make the top class. When they were basically characters, I fell back one, and my friend Fred Curlinger, who couldn't speak Japanese with beans, but had a, but I, yeah, you know, a, a photographic mind, he memorized those characters, he would go to the top, so we were constantly changing. But every Saturday, the classes would shift and alter depending on how well the, the students did. We had study hall every night um, except Friday. And 
I think on Friday they had a, a beer bust or something like that. But we couldn't go out uh, while school was on, except on Sunday when we could go to church if we wanted to. And we did because that's where all the pretty girls were. And then uh, even the, even the uh, students who were older and married and had brought their wives to Ann Arbor and gotten apartments for them could not go and spend the night with their, their uh, partners, with their wives. They had to stay for, in the for, barracks. For fear they would speak English. Who knows? <clears throat> It was, it was, it was quite, it was a rigorous program, and people who paid close, you know, Jimmy could read Chinese and Japanese fluently. He had no trouble. I don't know how his speaking was, because I never heard him speak either language, but, uh, but he was very good with the character. I had a terrible time with characters. So then, then you found yourself on the, on the same ship, is that right? Well, uh... When the war ended, um, yeah, I don't know if you remember or not, but in World War II, if you were drafted, you were drafted for the duration of the war. You didn't, you weren't drafted for three years or two years or for you. You were in until the war ended. When the war ended, obviously, a slew of people wanted to get out all of, all at once, and in fact, there were riots in Europe because the soldiers who felt that they had done their duty and were entitled to come home. So they devised a point system whereby you accumulate points by how much combat you've had and how many years you've been in and what your rank and so on. And, and uh, the commitment to the language school required four years of active duty. That was, that was agreed to. Uh, but when they, when they started letting uh, draftees out of the service, they included the language people too. So there was a tiny, well, what was left then was divided in half. There were those who had already had basic training before they came to the school and those like me who had not. So the ones who had basic training were sent on to the advanced school at, at what's the name of that? It's a fort outside of, of of uh, Minneapolis, it's a very old uh, fort, uh, but that was the advanced school, the advanced program. So they went there directly. The rest of us, all those guys in the picture, went to camp someplace in Alabama. I don't know why I can't think of it. I, I didn't think I'd ever forget that place. And and we then went through. A, 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 a 16 week uh, basic training collapsed to 12 weeks in which we did everything the 16 weekers did but we had to do it in 12 weeks so there were about a dozen of us and then a whole company of of uh, West Virginia coal miners kids you know it was an interesting interaction but we did, okay, we decided, we had a meeting at the beginning of basic training and we decided we would cooperate with the military and we would not claim that we didn't need to take basic training because it had nothing to do with what we were supposed to do in the Army anyway. So we went through it and that's, that's why I wish I had that picture of, of uh, Jimmy behind the machine gun. <laughs> Well, we did all the stuff that, that all the basic trainees did. And then we went up to that, uh, to, uh, what, is it, what is the name of the place outside of Minneapolis? Fort, Fort. Snelling. Uh, Snelling, very good. Golly, to Fort Snelling. And there we had advanced Japanese and we got our commissions. And within a few days, we were on a train to Seattle, and within a matter of hours, we were on a ship, the USS Milford Victory. I think it was one of the last ships that were built in Sausalito by Kaiser Ship Building Company, and 10 days later, we got off in Yokohama. 
Now, mind you, I had left Yokohama at the age of 12, okay? And Yokohama was a big, bustling city and a huge harbor with all kinds of uh, shipping going on. When I went back, I was 19, that is, five years had passed, and the place Seven? was... A, 12 to 19? And, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right, of course. <laughs> and I'm having to sit here, <laughs> biting being my tongue. Being photographed. <laughs> uh, being photographed. No, you're right. It was, it was seven years, and the place was a shambles. Yokohama was just rubble. So that began our... But if we got off the ship and got on a bus and drove up to... Tokyo to this Addis building, which had the officers' club and so on, the quarters. And then we got assigned to various places. <clears throat> Jimmy, um, I think originally he got an, an assignment in Japan. I'm not sure where. But we also had a colleague named Don Helm. <laughs> Don Helm was a BIJ, and he had family in Tokyo and Yokohama, Yokohama. especially, yeah. and yeah. he as he was he was set to go to Korea. He was on the list to go. We all dreaded the list when it came out, you know, because we did not want to go to Korea. We couldn't speak Jack Korean. Didn't know anything about Korea. Didn't want to go. Uh, so Jimmy was on the stay list, and Don Helm was on the go list. And Don persuaded the authorities to let him stay because he had family there, you know. And guess who they picked to go to Korea? In his place. <laughs> they, they, picked, they picked Jimmy Cahill, and that's where so he ended up. I don't know what happened. I don't know what kind of unit he was in. I don't know what and he his never, assignment was. He never forgave Don for that. Nope. It was a little uh, rough point. But I don't know. Okay, I'm gonna stop for one second. Sun, one, two, one. Okay, one clap, just like this. Three times. Go ahead. Everyone. Okay. Wow. Uh, and you'll see if the gap closed, but it's going to be straightforward. Yeah. Thanks. Great. That didn't match. It didn't meet. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, are you ready? <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so when did you next see uh, Jimmy? Um, he did. He did come back to Tokyo. Stop, stop. One thing after another. Okay. So, well, Jimmy did come back and was assigned to a Tokyo assignment, but by that time I'd been transferred to Yokohama. Not that, not that it's that far away, I mean, it's easy drive back and forth, but my time was now mostly in Yokohama, and I didn't see Jimmy but once or twice in the officers' club when I would go up on the weekend. 
But although we didn't come back on the same ship, we all came back at about the same time because we persuaded the army to let us out a little early. See, I was I was supposed to be separated in April of what would it be? 45, 49, but I got out in August of 48 because we all applied to get back into Berkeley. So many of these guys in that picture that you I think all went back to Berkeley together and uh, we took regional group major on Japan, which was an interdisciplinary program. And we would often have classes together from the big shot Berkeley professors who were, you know, who were really wonderful. Uh, but I didn't see much of Jimmy because he was a class ahead of me. He was a junior and I was a sophomore and I just didn't, I didn't uh, have much social business with him. And then he went off to Michigan to get his PhD and then he was in the Freer Gallery for a while, by which time I got my PhD and went to San Jose State to teach. I lived up here, but I taught in San Jose State and he came to Berkeley. And uh, just didn't see that much of him. We were not, we were never really close, except for this common experience that we had in, mostly in the language school and in the occupation overseas. Although he was in Korea most of the time that I was in Japan, so it was not, uh, we, we never got to be that close. But there was an emotional tie because of well, it was a, 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 training and sharing those experiences in yeah, Japan. Yeah, yeah, we were bonded in that sense. We were, we were glued because of the common experience of the language school. Now, can you tell me the story about those prints again and and uh, how they? You, you said that he discovered. Oh, that's your story. Yeah, that's yeah. my story. Well, then we should start with. Uh, how you met Jim? I, um, I met, well, actually the story begins before I, I met Jim because Jimmy in high school went to Berkeley High. His parents were divorced and <clears throat> so he was staying most of the time with his friends. <clears throat> One of his close friends was Hans Berwald uh, Hans was a B.I.J. He was born in Japan. So, and his father had been a businessman in Japan. <clears throat> and the way they conducted business in those days was to talk about art and um, kabuki and so on. My father-in-law described the process to me. He said they would sit and drink tea in a very informal setting. And um, they would talk about Japanese woodblock prints or um, whatever. And then after about two hours of this, my father-in-law said, someone would bring out a piece of paper and say, I have this dirty, wrinkled, awful piece of paper, but I'm gonna have to beg you to put your name on it, or your hanko, which is the Japanese seal. Like a, like a stamp. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, and that would be the, that would be a contract, of course. <laughs> so that would be the business. But most of the time, they talked about art and whatnot. So my, my father-in-law gathered quite a bit of Japanese woodblock prints, had quite a collection. So when Jimmy came to the house, he, um, was struck by these apparently. My father-in-law describes it, that he took to it. And my father-in-law claimed that Jimmy could tell good art from bad art. Now Jimmy himself, when I asked him about that many years later, said that's not true, that when he went to Japan, he bought a lot of junk. He, didn't, he, he couldn't tell the good from the bad. He said that's not true at all. But my father-in-law, just really admired Jimmy's ability to relate to the Japanese art. And I have a number of prints from that collection that, that were what 
that were Jimmy's introduction to Oriental art. And if you'd like to see them, I'd be happy to show them to you. I think we saw them before, so we can. And then yeah, she goes up to oh, shot the close ups. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're still we're still getting reflections every time that uh, um, the we're iPad still hits. Making reflections. Every time the sun hits it, it bounces it was right. Not me, because it was it was here the entire time. It was in the shadow yeah. the entire time. Is there a? Is there anything else saying that right there? Right there. Uh, yeah, pull that the pull it turn it over. But it's moving. It's a moving. Moved. Something moved. I don't know. What yeah, about the yeah. telescope. I, I know. Think we, we, okay. We um, so, so how do you? Uh, okay, that's the beginning. That's how he. Gets High school. Art. Yeah. How did you meet him? Um, we were taking a class, Hans and I were taking a class in international law in, from Hans Kelsen. He, uh, Hans came, was with a bunch of the guys. They came in from the top. It was a huge class, and there were two doors one at the bottom, one on the top. And I had to come to class from another part of the campus. So I always came in a little bit late. And I came in the front and, and, and kind of sneaked in and sat down in front. And Hans watched me every day coming in. And um, <clears throat> then the next semester, we were in a class together. So he introduced himself. So we became friends, and we were taking some of the same classes. And uh, so one day, I was talking with Hans outside one of our classrooms, and um, this was in Wheeler Odd Auditorium, and up the steps comes Jimmy uh, saying, Hansi, 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 bouncing brilliantly. He's such a charming, charming young man. And, um, <clears throat> he and he and Hans were obviously very, very fond of each other. So um, Hans introduced me to Jimmy, and then we were all friends after that. Um, that was how we year, met. What was the year when, when this happened? This was, was probably 1948, maybe 1949. Can't remember, spring of 48 or fall of 49. So it was just after he returned from, from Korea. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then you stayed friends after that? Uh, yeah, um, we didn't see each other a lot, um, but I, I never forgot him, and um, we did see each other from time to time, particularly at Bearwald's house. Uh, they lived in Berkeley on Rose Street. Um, and then when, when Hans and I graduated, Jimmy and, and Gordon Sear put together this marvelous opera, operetta, which sounded like something that Gilbert and Sullivan would have written or would have liked to have written. And um, they came to my, I was living with my aunts at the time, just a block or two from where Hans's family lived. Um, so everybody gathered there at my aunt's house and and they had a piano, and Jimmy and Gordon pounded out this wonderful opera, <clears throat> sang it, and it was extremely funny. Um, Gordon, of course, went on to be a, um, a, prof a professor of music at some southern college, I'm not sure, North Carolina or something. And uh, he, he uh, at that time, he was running an elevator, <laughs> and Jimmy had to had to get him to when he wasn't working so they could work on this opera together. But they put it on at the house, and we had a marvelous time. Jimmy was extremely funny and very, very gifted, of course. Can you repeat that part one more time? Oh, Jimmy was very, very funny and extremely gifted, of course, as we all know. Very creative. Did anyone take pictures of that? No, we didn't in those days. We didn't have cameras. Nobody had a camera. Um, so he wrote an inscription in this book for you, right? Yes, Jerry in this did. one. Yeah. Uh, would you read it for me? <laughs> yeah. And tell, tell me, uh, set it up a little bit with when this happened. Well, <clears throat> we'd contacted Jimmy when we heard he was moving back to Berkeley. We were looking forward to 
you know, hopefully years of having pleasant get-togethers. Um, and uh, turned out he was in bed, sick in bed, and he couldn't come over. So, um, but the son of our very dear friend, well, <laughs> mixed feelings, Don Helm, the one who had resulted in Jimmy's going to Korea so that he could stay in Japan, um, his Don's son, Leslie Helm, had written this wonderful book about five generations of the Helms in Yokohama. Um, so Jimmy knew about the book, and he asked me if I would bring it to him. So I did. We, well, we brought it over to the house. And I also brought this book, which we'd had for many, many years. Um, and he wrote... Um, <clears throat> he wrote in it from his in in his bed from his bedside he wrote for Diane and George an old an old book for two old friends from the very old author July 29 2013 James K Hill so our dream of having fun with Jimmy didn't come to pass so <coughs> The end of that story. Okay, since there, since there was a lot of rattle in that, I wonder. Oh. If, is it possible to look at it without the, yep. the plastic oh. cover? Yep. So is that, does that mean we have to repeat it? I, I would because uh, it, it, it's just was, top, yeah. it was just nothing but noise. Oh. Uh. Is it in the. Um, I know it's, it's in the. What do you say again? Is, is the cover in the lighter shot? Cover in the what? It's just the, it's just stuff that's it's covered. the plastic. No, I understand. Is, is the cover, otherwise you could do it without the cover altogether. Well, actually, if she's going to hold it up, I don't uh, think you need to hold it to us. Just, oh. Just read it. Just oh. pick it up and read it. Okay. Because we'll take a oh, shot okay. of, the, of the actual text and use that. Oh, okay. To show. Oh, just okay. Pick up the book and. But, the, I, but she needs to tell part of the story. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. So. Can't remember what I said. Well, well, it doesn't matter. Just it, he'll ask the question again. You were talking about. Uh, uh, well, I asked you how that that inscription came about. Uh huh. And, uh, you started by saying when he moved back to Berkeley, you were. Oh yeah, when wondering. he moved back to Berkeley, and we were looking forward to. So many happy get-togethers and having a good time, maybe for years to come. Um, but we, he, our old friend Don Helm, his son, who is a writer, Leslie, one of his sons, is uh, had written a wonderful book about the five generations of the Helm family in Yokohama, and. Uh, Jimmy knew about the book and wanted to wanted to see it, so I said I'd bring him a copy, and he asked me to do that and told told us where the house was, and he 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 said uh, that he would be in bed because he was not well and not going out. And we asked him to come for lunch, but he said he couldn't do that. The only time he went out was when he went to the doctor's. So that didn't sound very good. But anyway, we went over and brought the book to him. And <clears throat> just for the heck of it, we brought this old book that, I guess this was yours, dear. This copy was yours. Uh, you'd had it for many, many years. Um, when was it published? Um, well, it's an old was. book. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> he wrote, he inscribed it. And he just said, for Diane and George, an old book. For two old friends from this very old author, James K. Hill, July 29, 2013. Good. Okay. Um, are, there, are there any stories that you, you had, that you've talked to with Sarah that I'm, I'm missing? We get, did, did we get pretty much everything? Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to ask you very generally to tell me what, um, what Jim Cahill meant to your life, to your lives. 
Mm. Shall we talk simultaneously? So you get... <laughs> yeah, simultaneously. <laughs> Sing it in Japanese. Yeah, right. In Japanese, right. So what did Jimmy mean well, to you? What did he mean to me? He meant he was a model of what I thought a, a scholar and a gentleman ought to be. He was generous, kind, thoughtful, all of those things. And, uh, but most of all, I was impressed by his scholarship and the way he produced sort of uh, world-changing views of Chinese paintings, for example. You know, I mean, he really, he really changed the art world as far as Far Eastern art was concerned. That impressed me immensely. But mostly he was just a very good friend, of someone that I think I could have taken up with after not seeing him for years, and we would have been right back where we had been before. He's a wonderful guy, wonderful, wonderful guy. And what did he mean to you, my dear? <laughs> um, I would have married I, him, but Hans asked me first. <laughs> no, no, I didn't have romantic feelings toward Jimmy. Uh, what Jimmy meant t to me was very different from what he meant to you. It, it sounded, a person sounds very staid from what you're saying. And to me, it was his delightful personality. He was such fun to be with. He uh, was extremely funny, as I've said, and um, just just a delight. He, one would never, ever be bored in Jimmy's company. It's, there'd always be something, something new, some new observation or um, a new take on, on something. And... Um, for example, the the uh, Gilbert and Sullivan opera that he wrote was um, so much like Gilbert and Sullivan, and yet it was I think it was better. He was just fun to be with. I just loved to, and and was wonderful to hear over the years where he was. We always knew where Jimmy was and what, pretty much what he was doing. There was sort of a grapevine among these people that you know were together in the old days and we'd, we'd keep track of Jimmy he was getting very famous and we were very proud of him from a distance of course because we were in different parts of the country so what Jimmy meant to me was just some a spectacular person just a sort of a, a star in the realm was I'm just delighted that I, I knew the little that I saw of him. I is just I treasure it every minute from the moment I first saw him. And till we saw him in in his bed and he wrote that inscription. So we all loved Jimmy. Where's the Kleenex? <laughs> yeah, really. You get to have your drink now. <laughs>